that is so unethical you can't do that hello friends and welcome to another video today we're going to talk about the silent patient written by alex michaelides yeah alex michaelides and the reason I wanted to make an entire video about this book, first of all, because it is October and October needs some good thriller reads. Second of all, because it was a Goodreads Choice 2019 winner. And the final reason, and probably the most important one, is that I'm a psychologist that has worked at a forensic facility. So I thought it would be super fun to give you guys my booktuber review as well as my review as a psychologist. And if you like these kind of videos, then don't forget to click that subscribe button and hit that bell so you never miss another video of me again. Let's get started. The Scion Patient, in my opinion, is definitely a psychological thriller because a lot of it is built upon the conversations between the psychotherapist and the patient. And also towards the end, it is revealed that everything was about this mind game. And I think that is kind of the essence of a psychological thriller, but on Goodreads it's mostly classified as a mystery thriller. The Silent Patient is about two main characters. One is called Alicia, who is the Silent Patient, I'll get to that later, and Theo Faber, who is the psychotherapist. Alicia has a seemingly perfect life. She is a painter who is married to Gabriel, a famous photographer. They live in this grand house and they just have a happy life together. Then one day Gabriel comes home late at night and Alicia shoots him five times in the face. And because Alicia refuses to talk, it draws a lot of media attention and this domestic tragedy becomes a mystery. And there is Theo Faber. He's a criminal psychotherapist and he really wants to work with Alicia because he thinks he will be the one to get her to talk about what happened that night. So we have two POVs, Alicia, who we follow through journal entries, and Theo. As a booktuber, I really enjoyed this book. There was a lot of dialogue, there were different timelines. What I thought was really interesting is that we both have Alicia and Theo in the present, but then they both have a kind of complicated past and a complicated relationship and throughout the book you find out more and more and somehow the author makes all these timelines come together in such an amazing plot twist. I was actually doing a puzzle, like a physical puzzle. Yeah, I'm very old. And I remember that when the big reveal came, I dropped my puzzle piece because I was so shocked. <laughs> and that's pretty brilliant because not a lot of books surprise you nowadays, and especially not when you are a bookworm like me. So that is something that the author did really well. I really liked all the characters in the book. Besides Alicia and Theo, you also have their partners. So Theo has a girlfriend called Kathy, and Alicia Alicia has a husband called Gabriel. They play minor parts, but still are essential to the story. And then of course, we also have the patients at the Grove. One of them is called Alif, who is a big Turkish woman who is really aggressive. Um, she also has a psychiatric disease, and I think she killed two of her family members. I can say I've met types like a leaf, and it's really intimidating to be around. Also really unpredictable, so things could escalate in a second. You can say something that maybe is seen as an attack, or you could do something or give someone the wrong look and then things could be really aggressive and that is what happens a couple of times in the book as well. I also thought it was really interesting to read about the two ways that people were treated at the Grove. So at one side you had the psychotherapist who just were focused on retrieving memories and talking about stuff and working through it with treatments. And on the other side you have Christian who I believe is a psychiatrist at the Grove who just pumps everyone full of medicine so that they are passive and less aggressive. To be fair, sometimes that is the only way because if people are too aggressive and they can't be calmed down, you have to sedate them because there are other people in the clinic that stay there and work there and everyone needs to be safe. Personally, I believe that treatment is the best option combined with a suitable amount of medication. This book pretty much has it all. An interesting location, interesting characters, good dialogues, and a 
lot of suspense. It's a psychological whodunit with a brilliant ending. And even though it felt a little bit unrealistic at times, like when Theo made a career switch from criminal psychotherapist to part-time detective, I still really enjoyed the book and I gave it four and a half stars. And a silent patient movie is in the works. I'm so excited about that and I'm definitely gonna go see it once it is released. So that was me reviewing the book as a booktuber. Now we'll get to the juicy bit, me reviewing it as a psychologist. And yes, I'll probably be overly critical, but that's kind of the point of this video. And just keep in mind that these opinions are my own based on theoretical knowledge and my work experience. The first thing that I noticed is that the security at the Grove sucks. I'm not entirely sure if this is mentioned in the book, but I'm gonna assume that it is a forensic clinic because you have people there that have murdered other people who are already convicted for their crime and also have a psychiatric disease. So if you have two people in the story that murdered other people with a psychiatric disease, I'm gonna assume that everyone at the Grove, or at least at that department, is gonna be a woman who is convicted for a serious crime with a psychiatric disease. So where's the security system? Where are the isolation rooms? Where's the beeper that you have to carry with you at all times. Where are the security guards? Where are the cameras? Where are the systems that you have in place once you have aggressive people on your unit? And yes, aggressive behavior does happen, but in this story it happens like three times and pretty serious incidents. That's not normal. You take measures, you have a system, and it doesn't happen on a weekly basis. Seeing as we're already on this subject, let's talk about Aleph. So as I told you, Aleph is a very aggressive woman that has had multiple aggressive incidents. Why is he still walking around? What is she doing there? If this is not a high security facility, transport her to another facility. This woman doesn't belong there. She is so aggressive. She is so violent. She is so intimidating. There should be a protocol for her. There are multiple incidents with a leaf and she can just walk around. She can just go to her therapy group and she can just talk to other people. There's no punishment, there's no incentive, there's nothing there to help her move on from this aggressive behavior. Especially because the author also talks about the treatment through medication where people are heavily sedated, so why wasn't Alif sedated? I mean, Alicia was sedated at some points because she was aggressive. So what is Elif still doing, walking around and shouting at people? I just felt that that was a bit unrealistic and that the character was mainly there to intimidate you and just get a feel of what it could be like in a clinic, but it isn't how it goes in real life. Talking about rules and regulations, when I, as a psychologist, take it upon myself to visit relatives and people that my patient knows at their home, I would be fired. That is so unethical. You can't do that. You can't run around and call people that know your patient, ask about them. It's just, it's not done. You cannot do that without permission from your patients. Another thing that I thought was really unrealistic as a psychologist is the diagnosis that they gave to Alicia. So from the start, it is mentioned that she is probably a borderliner and she has a borderline personality disorder. For those of you that do not know what a borderliner is, so these people have a huge fear of abandonment or instability. They most of the time have very big mood swings and they also have a hard time of connecting. So really connecting to people and maintaining those relationships. They feel this big void inside themselves and they just want to fill it. They don't know how and they will do anything to get your attention, even though this could be in a very negative way. So this could be seen as a cry for help. And one of the extreme examples of this is automutilation. So the thing that bothered me about saying that Alicia is a borderline it's first of all she's the silent patient so she doesn't speak and my experience with borderliners is that they will let you know why they feel like that why they feel empty inside and what they need from you they will give you cries for help. This diagnosis just doesn't match with Alicia's character. She is the silent patient, she doesn't draw any attention to herself. She is just a person that lives her life silent in the clinic. People with borderliner would definitely not do that. They would let you know, they would cry for help. Also, it reveals itself in the teenage years. So there would have been symptoms with Alicia in her past 
that would let us to believe that she is a borderliner. And as far as the reader knows, there weren't any apart from her being depressed from time to time. That being said, it is also highly unlikely that you go to a forensic clinic without going through diagnostics first. And of course, this isn't as described in the book, solely based on observations. The final thing that I wanted to read about as a psychologist is the treatment of Alicia. Because in the book, Theo, our criminal psychotherapist, has this great idea of just talking to Alicia by projecting her emotions and just talking to her and keep talking to her, she will eventually talk. I have no idea how he came up with that, but I don't think that is a solid treatment when you have somebody that doesn't talk. There are a lot of options that you can use. And I felt like the author was on the right track when he suggested painting because this is something that Alyssa used to do and through painting she could express her feelings. So they did that, they made her paint, she did one painting and then it stopped and she still didn't talk. So I just felt again that that was really unrealistic because normally you would look at different treatments like music therapy, art therapy, and psychomotor therapy which is movement practice. I think that would have been my preferred treatment just going through movements and trying to see if you can evoke a reaction or an emotion. I once had a patient who had a lot of anger and couldn't express it and we made this wall with bricks, not actual bricks, just like soft bricks. And the patient had all these objects that had a negative meaning and he could throw them over the wall. So he could literally release himself of all the negative emotions and that actually works for people who have a hard time expressing themselves or talking about emotions so i feel like that would have been the perfect therapy for alicia and definitely something that theo as a criminal psychotherapist would have thought of but no he decided to just talk and talk and talk and that was all i wanted to share so this was really interesting because i got to look at the story from two different perspectives a booktuber and they're psychologists. And I'm just really curious to hear what you guys think. So if you have any questions or maybe disagree with me, let me know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching and let's stay in touch.